All right. Karen, is all your whole students, everyone's here? Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Nice to see, well, actually, I don't really have my glasses on, so I can't really see your faces, but it's nice to see the room filled with uh, smiles. I can see smiles, for sure. Hi, everyone. My name is um, Dr. Mary Kamiyu Danico. I am the director of the Wegland Endowed Chair for Multicultural Studies. And it's really my distinct pleasure to launch our very first Wegland series for the fall. I wanted to share a little bit, for those of you who may not know much about Michi and Walter Wegland, I wanted to share a little bit about the biography of who they are or who they were and why we get to have their endowment here. So Michi and Walter were really great friends of our past presidents, Bob and Agnes Suzuki. And back in 1999, Michi received an honorary doctorate here at Cal Poly Pomona. And she also left us this wonderful endowment where she really felt it was important to pursue the work of what we call now like diversity, inclusion, and equity. In those days, they used to call it multiculturalism. But it's really like DEI work. And she was very much ahead of her time. And I would also add justice. So sometimes people refer to as JEDI, right? Justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Michi is a survivor of the Japanese internment. She, prior to um, you know, being a, just an average Japanese American living in the United States, when Executive Order 9066 happened, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, Franklin D. Roosevelt sent in hundreds and thousands of people of Japanese ancestry and other people who were under the colony of Japan, which included Koreans and Okinawans as well, into internment camps all over, primarily on the West Coast and one internment site on Oahu. So after surviving that, you know, she came out, um, and went to school, and actually, actually during, she got a special order, and she was able to get out for a little bit, and she went to school for fashion design. And she worked for what would be equivalent to like an Oprah Winfrey, or Ellen DeGeneres, or Kelly Clarkson show that you all see, and she, or Jimmy Fallon, she became a costume designer for the Perry Como show, and really one of the first women of color who was a prominent you know, designer. She dressed Sarah Vaughan and Etta Fitzgerald and really some incredible musicians of that time and artists. Walter was, had a keen nose, a really good sense of smell. And he, he's a survivor of the Holocaust. And he became a perfume chemist. So both of them with their backgrounds, survivor of the Holocaust, survivor of the Japanese concentration camps, met in New York, fell in love, and really decided that, you know, we need to make the world a better place, right? When she became, when they became friends with Bob and Agnes Suzuki, Bob and Agnes were also activists, helping with support of the great um, boycotts, um, you know, supporting farmer workers and so forth. And because of their legacy, Michi and Walter left this incredible endowment. And what we do with Walter, um, Michi and Walter Wegland Endowment is to do programs like this, right, where we can inform um, folks about the different kinds of works out there, but also build community. It's such a wonderful place where we have students, faculty, staff, community members who come together to share in dialogues about issues that are so important to us to make this world a better place or to be as just as possible, right? Um, despite all of its flaws, there are folks who are trying to work, centering their work around social justice. So I am not gonna introduce our speaker, but I am going to introduce our moderator for today, and that's Dr. Jessie Vallejo. She has been a Wegland Endowed um, advisory member for as long as I've had the advisory committee, and currently she serves as the faculty associate. She's an incredible scholar musician. If you haven't had her class, I would definitely encourage you to inquire. She has performed at Carnegie Mellon. She has performed at the Hollywood Bowl with the um, Latino Grammy, um, at Gra at Latino Gra Grammys, Latin right? Grammy Latin Grammy Awards, right? And so, I mean, she's such a prolific scholar and performer, and I couldn't think of anyone more suited to really talk and moderate today's session and also introduce our keynote speaker. Okay. 
Okay, so um, this is my first time doing this, so I'm a little nervous, but I'm really excited to uh, be here uh, with all of you and to be celebrating um, our wonderful colleague, Dr. Wax's uh, book launch. And um, I'll read her bio real quickly and then I'll feel, fill in um, a couple other things. But um, so Faye Linda Wax is a professor of sociology at Cal Poly Pomona. In addition to Metamorphosis, her book that she just released, she is the co-author of the award-winning book Body Panic, Gender, Health, and the Selling of Fitness. She is also the author of over 20 peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, webcasts, and blog posts. Dr. Wax is a Los Angeles native attending UC Berkeley for her undergraduate studies and USC for graduate school, where she earned her PhD in 1999. When she's not working, Dr. Wax enjoys hiking, biking, and snowboarding with her family. Um, I also have to say she also goes to some of the best concerts. Like I'm always jealous of all the concerts she's getting to go see and um, I'm really excited to come and um, introduce uh, her today and to and to moderate um, this book talk because um, it touches upon a lot of I think really important topics that um, are important to me that I don't get to talk about in my field of music as much um, especially with um, you know questioning this whole concept of disability disability awareness like dealing with um, person personhood um, your sense of self, and then you know justice about surrounding our concepts of our bodies and of other people's bodies. And so, um, if you haven't read the book yet, we'll make sure that you um, will give out some copies. So don't leave early if you can stay the whole time. I know some people have class, but you know you're at an important college event, so stay here. Um, but uh, the book has just been really great to read, and um, I'm just so happy to have you as a colleague working on these things. And without further ado, um, let's hear it for Dr. Wax. So. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so metamorphosis, who we become after facial paralysis. So first of all, I am talking about a very specific type of facial paralysis, which is called synkinesis, which most people haven't heard of. It's a very rare condition. What is synkinesis? Synkinesis is a movement disorder that happens after damage to the seventh cranial nerve. It's a very unusual thing. It doesn't happen when you damage other nerves, but for whatever reason it happens when you damage the seventh, it doesn't always happen. Um, it's usually caused by something like Bell's palsy, Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, a tumor removal, most commonly acoustic neuroma, parotid gland cancer is on the rise though, or brain tumor, could be trauma, an accident, or um, in some cases they don't know what happened. Generally what happens is when, you, when the nerve grows back, it grows back to too many places. So you, you're not paralyzed anymore, but you're still not moving properly and it can look like paralysis because instead of when everything tries to move at the same time, nothing moves. And um, an analogy that one of the uh, physical therapists gave me was that imagine if you tried to move your arm and your leg moved instead. That's what's happening with synkinesis. You're trying to raise your eyebrow, but the corner of your mouth is moving instead. You also can have um, miswiring of functions like salivary glands and tear ducts. So you're trying to eat and tears are pouring down your face. You're trying to cry and your mouth is salivating instead. Um, it impacts communication, your affect, whether you're able to eat and how well you can eat, your vision. A lot of people, um, they lose the ability to blink their eye and you can lose your vision as a result of that. Uh, Dental health can be seriously negatively impacted, and generally there's negative mental health impacts. And so when we get into more of the social, uh, emotional impacts of synkinesis, communication is one of the biggest ones, being misunderstood, not being able to communicate effectively, not being able to communicate non-verbally. Um, your being in the world is disrupted. And what I mean by that is, I didn't realize until this happened to me how much of our reading of our own emotions actually comes from experiencing facial expressions. So I would walk around everywhere thinking like, why am I anxious right now? There's no reason for me to be anxious right now. This is, I'm actually should be very relaxed right now. And then I realized I wasn't actually anxious. My synkinesis was mimicking the way your face feels when you're anxious, so my brain was telling me I was anxious. Um, this is one of the most disturbing things that happens to people is they're constantly experiencing the wrong emotions because their face is doing the wrong thing. 
Um, it also disrupts your experience. So people would talk about when they would laugh or smile that it would remind them of their paralysis because they would feel it go wrong and that would ruin the spontaneous laughter. And then of course disability microaggressions were common and if you have other othered identities, you got sort of the double whammy of the disability microaggression along with the other microaggressions you were already experiencing. Every, every single person I talked to reported some exclusion and isolation, sometimes self-imposed, but still exclusion and isolation. So a couple of people, a couple of quotes from people that I think highlighted, Lori M. Um, said, it blocks the unis of you. There's a grief place. I felt betrayed by myself. It blocks your personality and you can't communicate who you are. You can't be who you are. Uh, Mary Louise, Marcy Louise, sorry, said, I feel ugly all the time. And it's not just about how you look. Feeling ugly is a feeling about yourself. And I think that the hardest part is the inability to smile throughout the total experience where uh, you know, it never even occurred to me in my life before what it is to smile, how it makes you feel to smile, how others respond. And now I know it just looks like almost like I'm snarling. I tried to, you know, practice. And when I see it, I think, gosh, people must think like I'm angry and it feels wrong. Instead of a friendly hello, I look mad. I feel weird. I'm trying to say hello or be friendly and it comes off totally weird. I think I'm lucky that I got married right before the paralysis began, but I was lucky getting married, finding my husband and marrying him before it really showed and I'm luckily married to a very good person who loves me and thinks I'm beautiful anyway and I feel very lucky because I don't feel ugly with him. Oh, that was nice because she was saying nice things about her partner, so I picked that one. Um, so how did I end up here? Um, this is me before. You can see I had a very normal smile. I'm sorry, I packed up, a, we're doing a remodel. I packed up a lot of my photos. That was one of the few I could still find. Um, November 2009, I was under a significant amount of stress. I was getting divorced. I was furloughed here at Cal Poly, so my income was lower than it usually was. We were having a, a real hard time here at the university. It was incredibly stressful. The only known risk factor I had was chickenpox for this, having had chicken pox is one possible risk factor, but I had no other risk factors that I know of. Um, can happen to anybody. 6% of the population gets Bell's palsy at some point in their life. Of that 6%, about 85% fully heal and about 15% get synkinesis. Um, so I was diagnosed with Bell's palsy, sent home. I was given e which I used religiously because I'm a very compliant patient. Turns out e may not be a good thing. It may actually cause synkinesis. We're not sure yet. So if you get this, don't do e -STEM. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so what did I do? I did what's called autoethnography. Autoethnography refers to work produced through the collective process of contextualized storytelling from an experienced standpoint. Um, so I had my own story to tell, but I didn't think that that was, you know, I, I have a, a certain amount of relative privilege. I, I'm partnered with a medical professional, much easier to get medical help when you can do things like that. I'm an academic. I have a certain amount. I'm able to talk to people in a particular way. I wanted to know what's happening to everybody else who doesn't have as much relative privilege as I have. So I interviewed 113 people with facial paralysis, uh, six family members, spouses, and eight medical professionals. Of the 113 people I interviewed, 81 were diagnosed with synkinesis. Nine probably had it, but didn't have an official diagnosis, but they were clearly describing synkinesis to me. Um, 11, it was unclear. It was either too soon to diagnose them with synkinesis, um, or they were in the middle of being diagnosed, so they thought they had it, but maybe not. Um, and 14 people had facial paralysis, not synkinesis. However, one of them has since contacted me to tell me she actually does have synkinesis. So um, the average interview lasted about an hour and a quarter, and most of them ranged between 40 minutes and just over two hours. I also attended support groups and on, um, in person and online. And of course, I still attend a lot of those events. In fact, I'm hosting one this weekend. Um, what are the key, summary of the key findings that identity is an embodied experience and much more than we've ever thought of and that your physical being in the world has a lot more to do with your experience of self than most of us realize. 
people with facial difference face overt discrimination and ongoing microaggressions. Again, not, not surprising, but the forms they took were. Um, and as a result, we get internalized negative self-concept. Um, one of the, my favorite stories was a gentleman who explained to me that he just apologized to people about his face as soon as he met anyone. And I mean, think about how you must feel about yourself if every time you introduce yourself, you say to people, I'm really sorry about how my face looks. I know it's disturbing. I know you don't want to look at me. That, that's a, saying quite a statement about how you feel. Um, adjusting to a new identity is a process and adequate support is very important through that process. And lastly, there's a lot of ableism and there's a lot of ideological repair work that protects ableism in our world. Um, what am I going to focus in on today? I want to focus in on that ableism, the idea of a social disability, how this gets minimalized, and of course this big question of am I a person with a disability? Because that was one of the questions I asked all of my participants. Do you see yourself as a person with a disability? And their answers were in no way consistent with their impaction. And then lastly, reconsidering ableism. Um, yeah, so. So first of all, why is facial difference such a big deal compared to say other types of disability? And coming out of the Victorian period, there was a very much a belief that your appearance tipped us off to your moral, your morality. So if you looked a certain way, you are a moral person, and if you don't look that way, you probably have issues with morality. Um, picture of Dorian Gray is Oscar Wilde's critique of that time period, of that. Um, and if you know the story at all right, it's a young man who is, is, remains beautiful while being very corrupt, but the portrait in his house shows all of the depravity that he's engaging in. But what this means is that we have this history in which people assume that if something happens to your appearance, you deserved it. You did something wrong, and now punishment is being heaped on you. And my subjects, absolutely many of them talked about, this is because I bullied that girl in first grade. This is because I was mean to my cousin when this happened. What did I do to bring this on myself? And other people often it, you know, participated in that blame as well, right? And some people said, oh, my brother said I got synkinesis because I didn't rest enough when I got Bell's palsy. Or if I'd only listened to the doctors more, this wouldn't have happened to me. And that, that's, that, there, that's not, like, we know what the risk factors are. People who are older are more likely to develop synkinesis, right? There's, there's, the risk factors are things you can't control. Um, Irving Goffman talks about stigma as identity spoiled. It's the reaction of others that's really the issue. It's not that you have a discrediting attribute, it's the way other people respond to it that sends you the message of your value and worth. And what we find is there's very much a conflation of disability and worth and value of human beings. So am I a person with a disability? The first thing is, well, what's a disability? Um, in the medical model, which is up until fairly recently has been our dominant model, it's been, well, it's an impairment, a limitation, or an impaction. Right? Pretty common, we all hear about this. And we generally group them as either behavioral, sensorial, uh, physical, or developmental. But over the last maybe 10 to 20 years or so, people have said maybe this is not quite the right way to look at it. Because a lot of people who maybe could benefit from some of the assistance we give don't put themselves in these categories. And there's a huge stigma for getting put into these categories. Disability identity models suggest it's actually a social category of stigma. That disability is an identity or an experience of being othered. And I always like to point out to people, I drove here today without wearing glasses. Right, I'm 53 years old and I mean, I, I use glasses for things that are really far away, but I don't really need glasses to see. That's fairly unusual for someone my age. How come people with glasses aren't considered disabled? Right, we consider that a normal accommodation. I drove here in a car. I live 35 miles from here. It would have been a long walk. I mean, I maybe could have biked it, but I would have had to leave really early, right? Why do we consider some things that we can or can't do disabilities and we don't, we consider others normal variants, right? It's very much a social experience. And what I found was that people did face a whole bunch of social challenges. I had some people who were legitimately assaulted. Um, 
men, older men, they were the most likely to actually be physically assaulted, where they would just be standing somewhere and someone would walk up to them, I don't like your face, and punch them in the face. There was sometimes alcohol involved when that happened. Um, I, but I also had other, and people who were, say, in the military, they were, you know, literally just flat out assaulted. Lots of microaggressions. Chapter three of the book, I'm not going to go through that today. I tried, but I was like, there's no way you can fit this into a 45 minute discussion. But lots of microaggressions in different kinds, lots of exclusions, isolations, right? So they're facing all these things. And I think Amanda G kind of sums it up as she said, when we went out to the Bahamas, uh, this was a pre-wedding trip for her, I heard people commenting. I was with my fiance and I overheard people making comments about, oh, he must be bringing his sister, his disabled sister on vacation. And those kinds of comments and that kind of reaction was very jarring for me because it was the first time I'd experienced that kind of reaction. And the way people talked to me or didn't talk to me, you know, people assumed that it was a mental disability as well as a physical disability. That And I found that the term Bell's palsy, people think it's also synonymous with cerebral palsy. So they think you have a physical deformity of some sort. You must be completely incapable in some form or another. You must be delayed. And that was a consistent issue with strangers. And I did not like going out in public for about a six month duration because it felt like I was constantly being judged. And that was like her pre-wedding, her pre-wedding trip where she was hoping, you know, to be the beautiful, you know, you know how people treat you when you tell them you're getting married, right? Instead of getting the like, well, some of you don't, but you, you usually get a lot of, oh, that's so wonderful. You're so beautiful. You look so great, right? And instead she was getting, are you his disabled sister? Um, and as she liked to joke, as she liked to joke about it, she said, oh, honey, if that's how you act with your sister, you should be in jail. <laughs> um, People tended to blame themselves rather than ableism. People internalized what they were dealing with. People internalized the microaggressions. They internalized the assaults. Uh, as I mentioned, this one gentleman apologized up front for his face when, wherever he went, whenever he met new people. Facial Palsy UK reports that about 76% of, pe of people with facial palsy face lowered self-esteem as a direct result of the condition. So as Amy G observed, she, she only develops, she pointed out this isn't just facial paralysis. There's more here because she actually had Bell's palsy twice. And she observed, I was, I mean, most people have some degree of vanity. I was very confident with my appearance before Bell's palsy. And even after my first case, I didn't have any residual effects. So I was just as confident after, I, after as I was before. With the second bout of Bell's palsy, I was constantly afraid of going out. I didn't want to be seen. I'm constantly anxious about my appearance. I don't like it when people notice it. I don't like it when it's called out or attention is drawn to it. And I go out of my way to try to hide it. It just makes me feel anxious. So it's sort of this ongoing you know, experience of now being incredibly anxious all the time that's both coming from within and from the experiences that you are having. And what we found, what, are I, what the theories that I found that really helped me with this was comes from uh, critical race theory, uh, spe specifically the work of Eduardo Bonilla Silva. He points out that when we're talking about race, there's a minimalization of race today, that people tend to discount the impact that racism still has on people's lived experiences, despite lots of ways that we can measure and demonstrate that racism is still absolutely having an effect on your lived experience. And Bonilla uses the term, uh, Bonilla Silva uses the term sincere fictions to tell about, to describe the stories that we tell ourselves to demonstrate that otherness is really no longer having an impact on lived experience. So, as Maddie L. observed, I was at this thing for my brother recently, and this happened before. I don't know, people were just acting a little off to me. Oh, you're his sister? Are you visiting from out of town? And it's a bigger question. There's something implied. I don't know why, but recently I felt like, I wonder if these people think I'm not well, like I'm not a fully functional person, like I'm Jason's broken sister just because of my facial problems. So I thought I'd just say something and explain what it is. So I actually tried to explain about my facial paralysis and they cut me off. They flat out wouldn't let me talk about it. Everyone said, no, 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 of course not. We all have our stuff, you know, people like to sort of trivialize, like I'm talking to one of my brother's friends and she, why is she showing me this discoloration on her hand? and saying we all have our things. You know, I get it's a big deal for her, but for me, it's like, that's your hand, not your face. Right, and so again, there's somebody who's trying to talk to people about this experience that she's having that's very meaningful for her, and they're, no, 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 everything's fine, you look fine, you look fine. 
And what people reported was this deep discomfort with talking about disability, right? So as Joanne T, a middle-aged cisgendered educated white woman noted that people couldn't hear her when she tried to express the fact that she was in pain, right? And so you say, sometimes if I mention it, I have friends, maybe they're trying to make me feel better, but they don't listen. They'll say, you look fine, nobody can tell. And I'll stop her and say, it's not so much my looks. Just because I don't show it, it hurts all the time. It really hurts so much, physically, I mean. I feel physical pain. But on the other hand, why wouldn't it be okay to just go ahead and also want to look a little more like I did before? I mean, to be able to smile and take pictures without worrying, right? So he, the, she's hitting on exactly, she's trying to share with people how devastating this is for her and that she's in pain. And everyone's like, no, no, you look fine. And I always think a great corollary for this is when someone says, I've got back, terrible back pain, I really hurt my back. People don't say, oh no, you look fine, I can't even tell that you're in, your back hurts, all right, let's go. Right? You know, what do people say, oh, do you, do, you, do you need to rest, do you need to sit down, do we need to take a shuttle, right? Oh, you're in pain, can I get you an Advil, right? And when she's trying to say, hey, I'm in pain, people are, no, you look fine, you're not in pain, you're, you look fine, there's nothing wrong, let's go. That's a minimalization. As Mandy V said, so my face is really tight all the time. It hurts, it's contracted. So I tell my friends this and they all cut me off and say, oh, you can't really, I hardly notice it. And I'm like, well, I know you can notice it. And they're like, no, really, it's not even that noticeable. Don't worry about it. I finally got up the nerve to say, even though it looks like nothing's going on inside of my face, it is like in constant turmoil. It's constantly pulling and pulling and it's pulling so hard. I'm in pain all the time. I mean, it's pulling so hard, it's moving my teeth. My teeth are actually moving. My nasal cavity is collapsing. It's not about you noticing, right? And again, she's bringing up these very real very serious consequences that people with facial difference have to deal with. And I should add that because this isn't well studied and we don't have enough advocacy yet, often these things are not covered by insurance, right? I had to fight for five years. I had to fight for five years to get my pain management covered with my help, with Kaiser. So am I a person with a disability? Right? We still haven't answered the question yet. And people, I, I say yes, by the way, for me. But people had sort of three, this is really two categories, but I grouped them together. People had sort of three responses to, am I a person with a disability? Rejection, no, absolutely not. Mm, maybe for other people, but not me. And then, yeah, I'm going to buy into this disability identity thing. So it's... The rejection were people who sort of were using the, um, I had that parking sign up there before, because they were sort of using the requirements for disability parking for what they think of as a disability, right? So Kevin said, I used to think because this is a disability, half my face doesn't work, that's a disability. But then I like realized, no, it's not. Like a disability is that you need a crutch, you need help to do something. Either you can't see or you can't hear or you need a wheelchair or something like that. So no, this is not a disability. I can walk, I can talk. Right, so that's a very narrow medical view. Kara R, similarly, I was really upset when I see that people labeled it a disability because I do support work for people with disabilities. I look after people with disabilities, with learning disabilities, mental health disabilities, children and adults. I've seen it all. I'm in the community. I'm not in that situation. I'm working. I'm making a difference. I'm helping people live a better quality of life. I don't think it's a disability now because it's you're, you're lacking your communication, but now that's debilitating, but it's not a disability because I'm still able-bodied. I can still do things. I've seen disability and it's not that, right? So she's looking at people who are more impacted than she has in different ways and show, well, well, it's not me because I'm not there, right? It's very distancing strategy. Um, another distancing strategy. It, Yes, but not me. Or, well, it's disabling, but it's not a disability. Say, so Angie C. said, do I think of it as a disability? Yes and no. With it came all these psychological factors, anxiety, social phobias, but physically, am I able to work? Of course. So it's not a really a disability, maybe for others. Right? This is where we're like, you see that, that our neoliberal productive views are very much embedded in our psyches, much to our own detriments. Elaine E. said, 
I don't know if it's a disability. It makes people look twice. It's not like having a stroke, is it? I don't know. When people have a paralyzed limb, that's a disability. People notice something is different. Oh, okay, something is different. And now people do know that there's something different, I guess. I don't know if it's a disability, but I'm constantly aware that there's something different. I wish I was able to forget sometimes about me being different. That's more a burden than always feeling different. So she's like, yeah, I don't think so, but I'm different. I feel different all the time. That's actually very much, right, the... the um, Identity model of disability. It's that the way you're being treated, how you're being made to feel, if you're able to access services. Oops. And then disability identity, Diane said, it is a disability because I can't go into any situation the way that I used to. It's going in with a disability. It's going in with a handicap. That's the way that I look at it. Some days it's worse than others. Some days my eye is more closed. Some days my mouth just won't do what I want it to do so that my speech is more messed up. I'll be out and asking someone a question in the supermarket or somewhere and they're not getting the question. They're not understanding what I'm saying and it's not comfortable. It doesn't feel good. It's not easy to live with, but what am I gonna do? I have no choice. I have to live with it. I live with a disability, right? And so there's somebody who said, yeah, this is a disability. Now, disability intersects with, intersects with other aspects of identity. So people with multiple visible othered identities face more problematic challenges if also identified as, dis as disabled and have more reasons to distance themselves from disability. Just to give you an example, one of the first people I interviewed, when she showed up at the hospital, she walked, she was, um, she had gone back to school, she was currently a community college student, um, but she was an older student, she was in her 40s. And um, when she showed up at the hospital with her face pulling sideways, unable to fully talk and communicate, they looked at her and said, this is an escaped mental patient. This is the hospital where they're supposed to help you. And so she like, they literally started calling around mental health care facilities to see where she had escaped from. And she's just wearing, she was wearing sweats because she was, you know, at home studying when this happened. And so she got freaked out and she ran home and she called her partner who was out of town and uh, explained what was happening. And her partner said, you need to be in a hospital. There's something really wrong with your face. You got to go back there. Broke college student, bus wasn't running anymore, walked back, so she's walking back and forth to this hospital that's two miles away. So she walks back to the hospital and again tries to get them to help her and they're not understanding her. Now I wanna point out, her partner could understand her well enough to understand what was going on. So clearly she is understandable. And as they're literally calling the police to have her incarcerated, a neurology nurse walks by and was like, what are you doing to that woman with Bell's palsy? That's how black people get treated when they walk into ERs with Bell's palsy, right? And so like, how is she, yeah, how is she, exactly, how is she going to, is she likely to go for a lot more medical help after that if she, with her synkinesis? And fortunately she did, because I met her at an event, but she found an event, she found people who were more caring, but that, it took her years after that experience to feel comfortable asking for help again. Um, what really did resonate with people, however, was this idea of a social disability. That disabilities, a, a social disability is something that impacts your ability to communicate with self and others, especially in social settings. Social, di social disabilities are not limited to those with facial difference and would include many other overlapping challenges. But every, this really resonated with people, where, uh, even if they said, no, it's not a disability, they were willing to say, yeah, it's a social disability. Um, and a lot of people actually also mentioned uh, Greta Thunberg and like how uh, Thunberg, how her face, like her, her, she often is affectless when she's speaking because of her autism. And they said, oh, it's like, yeah, it's like that. It's like people don't get me because my affect is different. Um, otherness means always having a social disability. So I went a little further and I would say otherness is a social disability because you are always walking into a situation with those judgments being made. That's the source of microaggressions. These larger structural beliefs that are problematic about otherness. Um, and you know, like Du Bois talks about that double consciousness, like people with facial difference really started developing that double consciousness, that different understanding of how they were seen versus who they thought of themselves as being. And that's where you saw that, I'm no, I'm productive, I'm productive, I'm not unproductive. But I like to point out, this is neoliberalism. This is that message that if we are not productive, we're worthless. And we have to really rethink that idea because everything in popular culture is that if you have a disability, you need to be exceptional to somehow earn art, like Rain Man, or you know, you've got to, or I think Wonder was the most recent one on facial difference. You've got to 
show us that you're special or different if, you're, if you have a disability in that way. These minimalizations are protecting privilege, right? To acknowledge, the, to, if you were to acknowledge what is lost, you would be acknowledging privilege, unearned privilege, right? Because if to acknowledge the cost of a loss is to acknowledge the privilege and value of those who have. It calls attention to what the society and culture fail to do to provide equity, to meet needs, to provide reasonable accommodations, and to institutionalize compassion, right? That is not, we are still stuck on this, are you useful? How are you useful? How much money are you gonna bring in? And I thought Patty D put it really well when she said, we have to struggle with our own ableism, right? Because for me, the most important part of this journey was me recognizing how much I valued productivity and how ableist that actually was. Patty D uh, observed, I sometimes wonder what people were thinking, because sometimes people have thought that I had a mental disability. I actually have a younger brother who is profoundly retarded. I don't know, I know that, I don't know what the correct term is now, but when he was diagnosed, that's what it was. But he's 53, 54 years old, and he's always, people can tell. So I'm very familiar with the, you know, the way people look at him, the way people treat him. Yes, I don't want people to think I was retarded. When they were looking baffled at what's wrong with me, there's definitely crossed my mind. That was a big part of what I've gone through, you know? I don't want to be seen that way. People don't treat you as fully human, but there's also my brother. He's treated like that. He's a person. Certainly, that's in my head too. And I thought this for me was, um, for me personally, was the most important part of this journey, was to confront my own ableism and to continually try to be a person that confronts that and thinks differently about, um, about it, right? So like, that's the thing I learned. It's not enough to fight for yourself full of the righteous indignation of the many wrongs heaped upon you because you didn't deserve this. You have to fight with yourself to not be the person continuing the system of oppression. Um, and what if none of us is the other? Amanda G's vocation, remember at the beginning, she talked about not wanting to be othered, th her vacation story. She didn't want to be seen as the disabled sister. And I also feel this strange sense of betrayal of abandonment when a boundary is set. There's something different about those in that other category that allows for their dehumanization. With that boundary, we reject what is contemptible to us, what terrifies us, in what it embodies, and what it threatens, and what our body could become. But more often, people found ways to reforge identity and power and advocate while questioning existing structures. And that, to me, was the most powerful thing, was to see the people, the, everybody come through this and start to ask, st everybody starting to ask this question. What does otherness mean? What does it mean to be other? And what can I do for everybody who's being othered to make this less painful? Um, so I hope I left a little bit of time for questions. I did want to thank Lisa McKinley and Dr. Baveka Zizadeh and the Facial Paralysis and Bell's Palsy Foundation who really, when they heard about my research, they, gave, they funded me, they helped me meet people, they got me into an extra published paper. Special thanks to Mary Danico and Jesse Vallejo and the Weglin team for hosting this event. Elizabeth Robinson for her amazing cover art. The person who did my cover is a person with facial difference. And uh, Peter Nicholas and the team at Rutgers University press. All right. Okay, so I guess we can sit over here and we can talk and then also if people have questions, um, you know, and we have copies of the book to give away. So if you want a copy, don't leave. <laughs> so while, while people think of questions, I mean, when I, when I was reading your book this last couple of weeks, I kept thinking about that internalized ableism and how much, just when we, we deal with something like, some of you know I had a broken ankle not mm -hmm. too long ago. Um, I have an invisible disability that I think has been a lot harder to deal with over the course of my life of just that like self-blame or wondering why me, what did I do? Um, and it, I was wondering if there were any other like quotes that stuck out too about like how people managed that that feeling that like you somehow deserved it or that you're broken and like how to overcome it because I think that's a really hard um, sort of psychological you know hurdle to get over. So yeah, there I remember one woman she she said it's um, 
I gotta remember what I un- anonymized it. Okay, purple dragon. I un- anonymized. She said, she said I used to be the purple dragon. All my friends would call me the purple dragon, and it, it came out because she had gone to this bar on her honeymoon, and they had just gotten hammered, and it was called the purple dragon, and she'd partied all night and had the best time. And then she looked at me. She said, I don't know if I can ever be the purple dragon again. And then I asked her, Are you gonna try? And she said, Yeah, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to get back the purple dragon. So like everybody sort of had that. I want to get it back. But I think the people who did the best who said, you know what, I'm not gonna get it back. And that's okay. Because I can get some, I got something else out of this. I got a deeper understanding. I became, the people who really got through it were the people who said, you know what, I'm not gonna look the same. And that's okay. I've become a more compassionate person. I've become a gentler person. I've learned to be kinder to people. I've learned, you know, one guy, um, one of the older gentlemen I remember, he said, he said, you know, when I was coming up, this, things were pretty racist. And he's like, and my whole family are really racist. And he's like, I'm not racist like them because I put together really early in life that having a disability is being an other just like being a racial other, just like being a woman, just like being, and he, this guy became a social justice warrior. He mentors uh, young people with facial difference. And I just like, and he's like, yeah, I don't wanna be like the rest of my family because I know what it feels like to other people. I thought that was really great that he, he took something that was happening to him and he extended to say, well, I can help people. I can help other people feel included so they don't have to feel like I did. Yeah, I guess that that makes me think of one of the other points of like the 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 like feelings I had of just reading about like people getting punched in the face just for like standing I think in the line for the movies yeah. or something like that, yeah. right? And like I it makes you wonder, you know, so many people would know and we do all these trainings on campus and things that treating people that way is not okay. <laughs> right? And there's a certain ways that you know when people um told you about how um they could hear their coworkers, you know, laughing about them or talking about them or realize they were imitating them behind them. I mean, people aren't doing it to their face, so you know people know it's wrong. Mm-hmm. But yet people don't stop doing it at all ages. It's pretty astounding. I mean, ha- did you get to talk with people or look into a little bit of like why do some people grow up being so antisocial that way, have they not gone through an experience like this to become a more compassionate person? Or You know, it's interesting because it, people who worked in social services, in healthcare, in educational settings, experienced that a lot less. Mm-hmm. So it's like in, in the settings where being kind and being helpful is the norm, it's like really, it's the norms of your institution. So institutions that had helpfulness as the norm, people were treated much more kindly. In like more cutthroat work environments, that's where you saw the most bullying, the most cruelty. And a lot of people said, I, I, left, I left that kind of work because they were never gonna change. That's how they, that's how they are. Um, so I, I'd say, I always tell students this too, if you're working somewhere and you hate it there, go, go work somewhere else, right? Like it's, it's the culture of an organization made a huge difference in how people were treated. And you know, some people talked about like, things were fine and then like their manager would leave and they'd get a new manager who wouldn't make any accommodations because the people who had acoustic neuroma also had single-sided deafness in addition to facial difference so they would often ask you know can I always sit on this side so I can hear better and you know one woman talked about how she you know she was doing great at her job getting great reviews and then they got a new manager and the new manager was like I don't make accommodations for people and it was she said it became very clear that he was trying to get her out because he didn't like her face and she finally said, I just have to leave because this isn't going to get better. And so, yeah, it's, it's really very much the leadership of a space and an organization that plays a huge factor in the way people behave within that space. Let's see. I have, I have more questions I can keep asking, but I, I do want to make sure if, um, if any of you have questions, come up here, raise your hand. I'll run over to you. My foot's feeling great, so I can run over to you now. Woo-hoo! <laughs> so... Here, into the microphone so we can all hear you. Sure. Quick question. So with all of the social justice um, activism and I would say enlightenment going on now, would you say that the ableism has gone up or down in previous years? That's a great question. Because and, and being a good sociologist, of course the answer is both. Um, I think in some ways, we've become more aware that we shouldn't be ableist. So we've learned how to talk about it a little bit better. But 
when I go into spaces that are supposed to be inclusive, tolerating, tolerating, let's say, let's say we're talking about, you know, autism or ADHD, tolerate, tolerating people in a space isn't the same as making a space inclusive. And what I often see is that we're, we're very good at talking the talk and we say all the right things, but we didn't actually make the space inclusive. And so like, that to me is, is one of my big frustrations. Or like with healthcare, like this, most of the stuff you get treatment for, for facial, facial difference, you're paying out of pocket. Even though we know, like Botox is the main thing they give you for pain relief. And I had to fight for five years with them saying Botox is for looks. And I'm like, no, it's for pain relief. It is the standard of care for pain relief. And yes, it does make you look better, but so what? Or I, one person, she put it so beautifully. She said, she said, you know, I, right before this happened to me, I also had breast cancer and I lost a breast. And she's like, they paid for the complete, they complete, paid for the reconstruction of my breast. They paid for a, new, a nipple to be tattooed on my new breast. And they told me it would be devastating to your self-esteem if you had to walk around without your breast. And she's like, let me be 100% clear. This is bothering my self-esteem way more than this ever did. And, and they're doing nothing for me. Two more questions and then we give away books. If you ask a question, you get a book. In the back. Okay, we have a question from uh, the Zoom. Okay, um, Sarah Langford is asking, Ooh. did any of your interviewees mention the types of compassionate acts shown to them that was really effective for them and not diminishing, pitying, otherwise bringing unwanted attention? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one woman, I remember, she talked a lot about going to an acupuncturist. And she said, she said, I'm not sure the acupuncture is helping my face, but the way this woman talks to me is absolutely helping me, so I'm just going to keep going. And I thought that was like a really, and what, what I asked her, what, what do you mean by that? And she said, she's talking to me with compassion, but she's not pretending this isn't happening to me. So I was what people, when people said is when people treated them, when people, you know, acknowledge their pain, even if nothing could be done for the pain, just having it acknowledged. Um, and one of the big things people talked about um, having friends who they saw got it is friends who would say to them, let's take a photo. I know you're uncomfortable with photos, let's make sure we get one that you're comfortable with. And then would take, you know, seven, if it took 700 photos, they would take 700 photos. Or they would say, what, what angle do you want me to take the photo at? Um, a lot of people talked about that as being an act of compassion for them. And many people, the other one, because, you know, we live in such a visual photograph world, social media, it's constantly being photo. People with facial paralysis hate being photographed. A lot of people talked about having the friend who would say, let's take a crazy photo. We'll all make stupid faces. And then they said, and now I don't stand out because we're all going, ah, right? And, and I look back in my own photos and right after I had Bell's palsy, there's a picture of me and my two best friends and we're all going, like this so that I don't stand out and look different. And that was like, people talked about that as um, really being really important to them when people understood how disturbing and upsetting photos were versus the person who would just take a picture and they look awful and then they post it on social media and tag them. They hated that. <laughs> Any other questions? You get a book? Yeah. <laughs> Swap the microphones. Yes, hi. Um, hi. Hello? Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Um, I had a stroke in 2017 and I suffer from Bell's palsy. It's traumatizing just thinking about it. Um, I was, I don't even know what to say. Um, how did you feel when people would look at you like, oh, what's wrong with her face? I mean, it, it just, it, it was traumatizing for me. Luckily, my stroke, um, it, the, my Bell's palsy didn't last that long. So um, I recuperated and I'm normal. I mean, I look halfway normal now, mm -hmm. but it was really scary to me. How did, how did you get past it? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question um, because this happened during toward the end of a semester. I came back to school. I had came back to school with pretty severe Bell's palsy, and in all honesty, like I remember thinking to myself, if this happened to one of my students, 
how would I want them to feel about walking into my classroom? And I said, I'd want them to feel that I still valued them, that they still were included, and that they still meant as much to me as they did before this happened. And so I tried to walk into situations with that attitude for myself, which was still hard. Um, I indulge in very weird looking shoes now because people will look at my feet instead of my face. And it's like five or six of the, my interview subjects said the same thing. I wear crazy shoes or I wear really bright colors so people look at something else other than my face first or I have a conversation starter that can doesn't have to be about my face. Um, I think people never fully get over it, myself included. I mean, there's definitely days when I walk by and like, there's definitely days, especially on Zoom, when I'm like, oh God, is that really what I look like when I talk now? Like, and right now, like I probably won't ever watch this video because that would be my attitude. Oh God, is that really what I look like when I talk now? Um, but I just always try to say to myself, if this happened to someone I loved, would I love them any less? No, I would not. And I always try, what I always say to people is like, if you got through this and you're back in the world, you deserve a giant pat on the back. You have been through a major trauma. You have survived and you are going on. Because the people, frankly, the people I met were the people who went on, the people who got it together to do an interview. What breaks my heart are there must be a lot of people who don't ever go out again. And I found, I found a few of them. They were the hardest subjects to get for the interview, but I know that there's people who this happens to and they just live very isolated lives after. I mean, one woman was rural and she basically see, sees people once a week, maybe a relative or two, and spends almost all her time with her pets. I think it's good. Okay. <laughs> all right, well, that concludes our talk. Can we give Faye a big round of applause? Thanks for coming. Also, we're going to have Faith sign her books. And so um, the ones who just want a book, yay, you get a book. But I also have some random names that I've already picked um, to get a book. So Faye, where do you want to be situated? Do you want to sit down here? Is this OK? OK. All right. So so if you've already gotten a book, come out and get in signed. And if you have questions, you can ask her while you're getting signed. And I'm going to call out some names. And do we have the name of the student oh, who oh, asked yeah. what, what is your on name? Facebook? Oh. Bryce. 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 Okay. Okay. Oh, do you oh, want me to? You, and you actually have one. So, <laughs> what, what about that? Oh, right. Yeah. Do you want I, can, I can call. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask about the name on Facebook. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh, it's my name. Oh, Mary no, for the the person who asked the question online. Oh. Oh. That was Sarah. Sarah Langs. Oh, Sarah's my wife. Oh. Okay. I got her. <laughs> All, right. All right. Christopher. Is it Wimmer or Wimmer, or Weimer? Christopher. Okay. You get a book. <laughs> 